Greetings, everybody. This is Christopher Messina coming at you from the Messy Time Studios, broadcasting as ever from the sunny beaches of Florida. It is the 14th of June, 2023, and I am delighted and honored to have as a guest today, Ray Naylor, who is the author of The Mountain in the Sea, a book I enjoyed immensely, and I reached out to him, and he graciously agreed to, to come on and talk to us for a bit. So, Ray, thanks so much for taking the time. Hey, thank you, Christopher. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'll dive right in. Love, love the book, and I'm not going to spoil it for anyone who I suggest they should read it, uh, and we'll put a link below. Uh, but this is your first novel, right? Yes, that's correct. And have you been writing a long time, and this is just the final draft that you actually finally liked, and, or is it uh, or is it just a whole new effort you decided one day I'm going to write a book, and here we go? Yeah, so I mean, I've been writing for a long time. I've been writing since I was 16, and mostly short stories, some poetry, a lot of different forms. Uh, I started out mostly in the crime genre, the sort of noir genre. I got published in Ellery Queen's Mystery, Mystery Magazine when I was in my 20s and published a novella back then and a few other things. And then I started in science fiction in 2015. And that was just because I had a science fiction idea. I had this idea that, um, well, if we solved the problem of death and we could all live forever, it wouldn't matter that much anyway, because none of us can remember anything from, you know, more than uh, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, right. Well, and, and certainly there'd be like an 80 to 100 year old, 100 year like horizon on memory. So, you know, what would be the, the point? Basically we would just become these deathless humans that still were just, you know, as fallible. Right. And, and right. forgot the lessons that we had learned uh, in the past. So I sold that story to Asimov's and I started selling more yeah. stories to professional magazines. And uh, and then in 2018, I started to get some of the ideas that would become The Mountain in the Sea. And I started it uh, a month after my daughter was born. Uh, so in June of 2019, she was born in May. And that is my single worst piece of writer's advice I can give to anyone is uh, yeah. always start a big new project right after the birth of one of your children. Oh, of course, because you get nothing but free time. It's not like exactly. to consume any effort. No, yeah, I get that. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> That's great. So yeah, and it took about it took about 18 months from the from the serious moment of starting the book to uh, finishing it and going into the work of trying to get an agent. It was done by December something of 2020. That's excellent. And when did it just come out? Uh, what was like? Came months? out October of 2022, and then in paperback May 30th of this year. Great. So I snagged it just as it, as it appeared in paperback. That's great. Um, and I'm going to spoil nothing uh, about the book whatsoever, unless there are parts that you like to discuss. Um, but I gathered a chunk of it was really informed by uh, your technical knowledge of of the ocean. Is that right? Yeah. So. It's interesting. My work with Noah actually post dates the the book. So I only started working with Noah last year. And I've always been interested in marine biology and biology in general, and also in a field called biosemiotics, which is sort of the study of life as uh, information and signals processing. It's it's uh, it's semiotics, which is mostly applied to linguistics and applies it to things like cellular communications and that kind of thing, and then all the way up to human cultures. So I had had those interests in the background for a long time, and I had been on Condal running some projects with youth uh, and talking to American scientists, marine biologists, um, and I think I was more inspired just by wanting to do some more research into that field. So mm. I'm quite often inspired in my writing by what I want to know about right. rather than what I already know about. And I started digging more and more into some of the marine biology and uh, and biology questions around the octopus, an animal that I'd always, always been interested in. And I think there's not that many people who aren't in some way interested in them yes. uh, when they come across them, but not, but not in any sort of really serious way until I got this idea to try to do basically a first encounter story, um, but with a species on earth and sort of more hard science based with the hard science being biology. Right, I, I, I wrote a quick quick review of your book for some, some of my readers and I, I, I don't know if you, you caught it, but I said it was about the encounter between the third and fourth most intelligent species on the planet. So I was, yeah. I was 
I was stealing from Douglas Adams, who, you know, in his formulation, huh. mice were the most <laughs> intelligent, dolphins were the second most intelligent. Right. <laughs> um, right. So yeah, I, I, I felt I felt I had I had to grab that bit of bit of Adams trivia. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then you know what I found very interesting is 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 not very often you can mix two different themes very well, but I liked your sort of, it's always fun to play what if with history, but it's also fun to play what if with, with, with the political future, right? And so <laughs> you sketch out a world in which corporations are even more dominant than they are now potentially, or exactly as dominant, I guess. <laughs> uh, but there are a lot of shifting kind of, you allude to a lot of shifting geographic and geopolitical lines. And was that sort of the most fun of, of, of uh, kind of playing, you know, playing chess with the future as to what could happen given today's dynamics? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it that stuff sort of emerged out of this idea that I had. Uh, I mean, the nation state is interesting, right? Because it's it's a relatively recent thing. And, and I think we live in this world and it feels very permanent that the world will be based around these, you know, nations. And, you know, in the of course, it's different here in in the United States of America and the new world, right? Uh, because those are all nations that are not truly nations in the old sense of the word. They're composed of yeah. different people coming together to form some kind of identity, you know, a, a new identity. But in Europe and in, you know, Russia and in, you know, most of the rest of the world, the new structure, and that really started back, I mean, in the 18th and 19th century was this, this idea that things should be based on ethnicity, language, and nationality, uh, rather than, say, an empire ruled by whoever could, you know, put it This is together. as far as my army got, that's the line. <laughs> right, right. Right. And it's fascinating. I mean, because I'm I'm reading a book right now called Vanished Kingdoms, which is an amazing book about all of these kingdoms that disappeared in, in Europe over the years that nobody, you know, uh, really talks about. And some people don't even recognize as having ever existed. Um, those kingdoms were largely composed of people who spoke different languages, right, mm -hmm. and had different ethnic and, and national identities, but all lived under the same rulers. And so for a long time, that was the norm. And then in the last 300 years at the, at the out, sort of outside, the norm has been to kind of base our structure around nationality of one kind or another. I thought it would be interesting to, to see what might, to think about what might come after that, like how the world might be structured beyond nation states based on ethnicity and nationality, what new structures might emerge. So that's kind of in the background of the book. And I don't go into a lot of detail in, in the book about who is what and where and why, um, because I, the action is sort of constrained a little bit more to the island. But I think it's it's fun to think about or interesting to think about what will happen to all these structures that we think of as being permanent, you know, 500 oh, yeah. years, right? Like uh, yeah. what, or 100 years from now, or even 50. Um, I don't think anyone thought when I was a kid that the Soviet Union was going anywhere, and then it did, right? And it collapsed like a big Oof. bubble, yeah. just gone, gone yeah. in, a, you know, a period of months, and yet, and yet not gone. Like it still has left its mark very clearly on, on the world. And you know, there's other places like Prussia, right, <laughs> that are that are just gone, but also still left their mark on on things. And um, right now, and I'm in, in the Part of the book that's talking about Galatia, right? And I mean, this it's fascinating that there were once countries that people fought and died for that ceased to exist, you know, as if they had never been or were, were subsumed by other places. And so I was sort of thinking, you know, what might happen in the future. I think one of the other things that, that got me thinking about that topic as well was um, the problem of Afghanistan. Yes. And the, and the, way, the way in which it's just never cohered into a, a nation state, which is sort of the only acceptable, you know, way of, of governing something, right, for us, uh, precisely because there really isn't such a thing as an Afghan, right? It's sort of this That's colonial buffer zone and yep. an, an invention, and instead you have this patchwork of, of peoples living in these mountain valleys, 
and nation states are just such a poor fit for something like that. And so that's that's maybe the the thing that got me really thinking about, you know, what other structures might be um, might be in our future. It's good. I like the way you play with that, right? Because that that was um, Shelley's poem Ozymandias, right? Right. Behold right. the yeah you know, the statue in the desert with nothing around it, and it was right. stalling the virtues of of the king Ozymandias who controlled all he saw. Well, good yeah. for you, buddy. <laughs> that was a <laughs> passing event, um, right? Well, it's, it's, it's true. I lived in Africa, worked in Africa a long time, and similarly, like chunks of East Africa have proved utterly resistant to the idea of modern nation state lines, right? And so, for right. you could live your entire life near the Rift Valley. And mm -hmm. in theory, you could have lived under six different governments in four different countries in 60 right. years. And that has not impacted your life at all. Right, right. It hasn't yeah. mattered in the slightest to you who says he's in charge. And um, I remember in old, a couple of friends of mine did a lot of work. They're from China, did a lot of Chinese historical work. And one of their... Uh, one of the great phrases which persisted throughout multiple phases of the Middle Kingdoms, you know, waxing and waning, mm -hmm. was outside of Beijing, the, the common phrase uh, amongst local rulers was, the mountains are high and the emperor is far away. Yeah. So, yeah, right. he's in right. charge. Right. Good for him. <laughs> right. Every now and again, someone shows up. They demand some taxes. I shake down the peasantry. I kick it upstairs like the mafia and they leave again, right? Yeah. And yeah. maybe they come and conscript some people for some corvée labor. Maybe not. Um, it is interesting, especially around the current hysteria we have for like a touch on a current hysteria about the U.S.'s southern border. Um, it's the only place in the world where kind of the most developed world kind of butts straight up against not incredibly developed world. And mm. up until even what, like 1850, 1860, you didn't require passports or paperwork to go anywhere. If right. you got on a boat right. and went to Europe and then traveled, no one stopped you at a border and asked to right. see paperwork. It just wasn't right. a thing. Yeah. No, it's very true. I, I, I think about um, it's, it's it's something that I'm dealing more with in the in the book I just finished uh, now, too, is, is the sort of political end of things. But yeah, there's a, there's a great joke in uh, the great sort of Soviet joke or sort of post-Soviet joke where a reporter goes to Svaneti in Georgia, which is way up in the mountains, and the Svan speak a dialect of, of Georgian that is practically uh, incomprehensible to other Georgians and have lived in this mountain valley for thousands and thousands of years, just pig farming and herding and, and, you know, subsistence farming. And the journalist walks up to a, a spawn and says, uh, can you tell me a little bit about how your life has changed after the collapse? And the farmer looks at him and says, uh, what collapse? Exactly. What collapse? And, and, the, and the guy says, well, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And he looks at him and he says, What's Soviet Union? It's a perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. perfect. Right. Um, there, yeah, I think we forget. We forget as modern. Well, I think we forget a lot of things as as modern people, right? We we live in the in, in these highly constructed environments, and so we we forget a lot of things. One of the things that we forget is that most of the world is still composed of of you know what we would have called peasants. Yeah, right. A long, a long time ago, people who probably haven't traveled much out of the area they were born in don't probably know that much about the what's going on in the rest of the world, and for whom their governance system is is pretty far away, ineffective, and not really a part of, of their life. And that's totally irrelevant. <laughs> totally irrelevant, right? And I, and I think for a, a a pretty solid portion of humanity, modern life looks a lot like it looked you know, hundreds or thousands of years ago, except maybe with cell phones or, you know, or that sort of thing. And I've certainly been to a lot of places where that's true. I spent about 20 years outside of the United States after joining the Peace Corps in 2003. And, you know, certainly when you, when you travel around, you see that most people don't travel. Right. Most people don't speak 
anything but the one or at the most two languages it's necessary to, to speak to get by in their area. And for most people, even in a country like, say, Tajikistan, even traveling to their capital would be extraordinary. So most of the Tajiks that I knew in Hujand, for example, didn't really get to Dushanbe, mm. you know, uh, more than a couple times in their life. Right. And, and I, I think, that, so I think that we sort of, uh, this top layer of modern society, the ones that are living a life that is kind of within the parameters of broadcast you know, television and and the kind of global monoculture and all those things. I think we're forgetting that that the probably two thirds of the rest of the world is not even remotely living a life that looks like that. You know, and we forget about other strange things like the fact that there's probably more slaves right now on on Earth than there ever were. You know, at any other period in history, but we just kind of changed the name to you know trafficked person. Right. And, <laughs> and, Give it a new name. You know, <laughs> right and forgot about it um I, it's so it's it's interesting to me because you know in a lot of ways um a lot has changed and in some ways almost nothing has changed and for most people there's not really any history mm. to speak of right they've, they've been kind of in the same life for so many generations that you can't really talk about global events you know to them no, oh, and in large measure, I, I have this debate kind of constantly. Um, a lot of that increase of sort of random, disconnected, non-contextual knowledge that streams into you. Mm -hmm. I often question the benefit. Like, I'm sitting here in Florida. Statistically, do I know that people assault people around the world? Yeah. Do I need to know the details of you know a carjacking in Minnesota? For what? Right. To what end? I mean, who cares? Right. In a large yeah. way, gen generally, would I like it that no one is attacked randomly in American cent urban centers? Yeah, but like, how does my getting outraged at the most recent, you know, the gang beating somewhere do anything for me or not for me? Yeah, and it's, it's, it's interesting. It. That's that's really it's a good point. It's a really good point. What really is the purpose of news? Right to a, to a large degree, it's things that um, that we are informed about, but that don't affect us at all. You know, and I'm not talking about, say, like news about politics, although you know that's that's a, a very divisive area. But let's say let's say that politics themselves are important, and um, and because we're in a democracy, we need to know how what our leaders are voting on and what they're and what they're doing and that kind of thing. But the rest of it, like you're, you're right. Like things like a carjacking that occurs in a place where that person could never get to your city to, you know, to carjack right. your car. You're not going here. I'm not next. Right. right. Having right. a picture of this guy doesn't let me know who I'm shooting at next when I have to pull out my my right. Side. <laughs> right. I mean, things, things that, things like that that aren't really a part of, of your life. What is, what is the necessity of knowing them? You know, what, why, why is it important to us? And I think we do have this extraordinary fear as modern subjects of being left out somehow. Yeah. Um, which I think drives a lot of social media. It's just this idea that, you know, um, we can no longer stand something that was uh, just part and parcel of modern life 20 years ago, which is that we're invisible and nobody cares what happens to us. In the slightest, right? In the slightest, yeah. right? Um, and before Facebook and, and and all of these things, the fact that you were invisible and no one but the people that knew you cared anything about what happened in your life was just a fact. Just a fact, right? It's not that interesting. I mean, I think I'm fairly gripping, but, you know, <laughs> people may not share that, share that opinion. <laughs> And, and certainly yeah. not the extent of carrying what I had for lunch. Um, right, right. That yeah. they are aggressively indif indifferent about, <laughs> and <Yeah>. rightfully so. <laughs> and so, and so now there's this maybe there's an illusion provided by social media and things like that that um, that you're not anonymous, right? And yeah. that, and that people care what you do like on a day on a day to day basis, but it certainly has to be an illusion. Right. It is, uh, but there's also a very pur there's a purpose to it. I find the modern uh, every single thing that, that ever happens anywhere 
99% of it's accompanied by, and a GoFundMe account was set up. Why am I <laughs> sending eight bucks to someone who got hit by a bicycle in Des Moines? I'm not doing right. this off. It drives GoFundMe and makes 8% of every dollar, right? Uh -huh. Like, I'm really sorry something happened to you, but to the whole world, I mean, I've been, perhaps I'm just an outdated guy who was busy preparing for contingencies in my existence and had insurance and all the rest of it. If you uh -huh. look at the news, apparently there are three of us in the world that are prepared for emergency in our own lives. Everyone else needs to beg strangers for cash when something unfortunate happens. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's very yeah, strange. I, it's, <laughs> I mean, I mean, the whole the whole construct of that sort of social media reality is 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 a strange one, and I think we don't know how to handle it either. Just because, I mean, first of all, I don't think our brains are very well designed for dealing with abstract relationships. Yeah. Yeah. We're very good at um, being in a room or being in a place with each other and treating one another with a certain degree of, of you know, caution and courtesy and, and that kind of thing when we're in that space. But as soon as we get really abstracted and, and sort of anonymized by the internet, um, it it gets a lot easier to treat it treat one another poorly i think you know and 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 i do think that that also, that actually degrades the way we treat one another in person eventually too but i i one of the reasons that why on my internet presence the only accounts i have are the ones that have my name on them you know so i'm i'm actually you know ray naylor on all of my accounts is um i think anonymity in a, in a in a sense is a little bit poisonous oh yeah discourse right sure um, i don't say something on twitter that i wouldn't say if i were speaking to you right right um and i don't i don't ever want to be the kind of person who's hiding behind a mask to like intentionally hurt you know other people for whatever reason including people that i strongly disagree with and i and i guess i also you know having come up in a in a family that is you know, divided between Democrats and, and Republicans and independents and, you know, uh, of various stripes, but always managed to sit around a Thanksgiving table with one another. Wow. Um, I do think that there's an extraordinary value to being able to strongly disagree with people in a, re in a way that is respectful of them and to continue to talk about, about issues, you know. I mean, I can remember difficult conversations happening uh, over immigration and you know other issues that people felt strongly about on one side of the family or the other, but um, it it certainly never degraded to not speaking to one another over politics. And now it seems like we've got a whole country not speaking to one another over politics, practically, right? Oh, it's, it's madness. I think one of the best things was it Moynihan who said so, so presciently. You're entitled to your own opinion, but but not your own facts. So far as I can tell, for the past 15 years at least, people have their own facts. And yeah. it's a very strange dynamic because similarly, having having in the private sector worked overseas for years in multiple cultures, um, and I was, all my, my colleagues on Wall Street would laugh at me because, you know, I went to the University of Chicago, so they assumed I was in the economics department. Mm. I graduated with a degree in, anth in anthropology. Uh -huh. and one of my first bosses asked me, like, why anthropology? I said, because it's all about primate fear, greed, and tribalism. He's and he uh -huh. said, I said, you just captured Wall Street perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that I never, I you know, I came out of the gate assuming that people just do not perceive the world the way I perceive the world. And yeah, it's all right, as long as and my experience has been that. Predominantly, it's, I'm not as I'm not as naive as as what Will Rogers, who said he never met a man he didn't like. I met a lot of men I don't like, and and women, and a lot of for a lot of good reasons, including they were probably really awful people. Um, mm -hmm. But that was my choice for kind of where I lived and worked. But predominantly, most people are trying to raise their kids, make a living. Right? right. They don't. There, there's not. I, I especially, and I'm curious about your thoughts on this because kind of the way you wrote your book. Um, sure. What I found fascinating is the degree to which this kind of nerdy click of chatterboxes called the World Economic Forum has become this bete noir to a certain chunk of the population who sees this vast conspiracy 
to right. take away personal freedom. And I've, I've had people who I, who I like and respect tell me this. And I'm like, I've, you know, a lot of people I know go to that. Not one of them is like, I'm going to make you eat bugs and take your stuff. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Klaus, he may be a clown. I've got no idea. But that, that, that kind of rapid anonymizing tribalism, which the internet facilitates is, is kind of, I think that I got a lot from what kind of what you've written, but it seems like that that was a theme as to how you were looking at how humans change their interactions. Uh, yeah, I like that idea of anonymizing uh, tribalism. You know, um, I think that what's interesting is to is to see the rise of misinformation and the, and the ways in which it has mutated. Right, so. I actually placed the kind of modern era of misinformation for myself around 9-11. Mm. Um, but I've been corrected several times by other people who place it differently. One is a doctor working in New York who says that, that the first misinform really strong misinformation he, the campaigns he encountered was around vaccines in, in the 1990s. Right. But then I was talking to, you know, um, to other people who think it was like the JFK assassination, right? And all of the conspiracy theories around, around that. Um, whatever it is, the internet sort of took that, let's say like pre-cancerous misinformation and metastasized it in sure. some horrible way. Right around, I would say 2010 to 2015 was like the beginning of it. And then it ramped up at an extraordinary pace after after maybe it was weaponized pretty well by Russia in 2014 around Crimea and stuff. And, and, and after that, it's just seemed exponential. And it really is about this ability to manipulate not only the, let's say, like not only in the information per se, but the idea that facts exist, right? Sure. Um, I keep I keep hearing from people, you know, oh, well, you have your what well, you believe what you believe and I believe what I believe. Right. And you're like, yeah, but we're not talking about beliefs. Like we're talking about something in which there are actual facts. Like there's an occurrence that either didn't happen this way or did. And there's good evidence to say it happened one way and not the other way. And what you're telling me is that my you know, that it's just a belief. Right. That like. Right. If you believe X, then that's just as good as believing Y, although Y is the thing that happened and X is just some made up crap that like, you know, some guy, some like, you know, huckster invented, uh, you know, six months ago about this thing. So what's what's strange, and I think this is really, I think the Russians were very effective at this in their misinformation campaigns. They didn't put, put together coherent narratives. What they did was just blow as much garbage into the system as possible mm -hmm. instead of you know uh, you saw it with uh with the the downing of uh malaysian airlines flight in ukraine right? right uh it wasn't about countering a narrative or presenting a coherent narrative their uh, of their own it was about just taking a shotgun filled with lies and sure. like firing it in the direction of the 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 truth enough times that people were able to kind of grab onto whatever it was um, so I think there's like, that's been huge, but then I think there's, a, there's something else that goes on. Um, and I'd be able to hear your opinion on this, but and you, so you can fully correct me if, 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 uh, if you think I'm wrong, I actually think that in the end, most people don't believe the crap that they claim to believe that, that there's uh, some, there's some part of them that recognizes where the garbage that they've been taking in begins because they seem to be able to identify what they shouldn't speak about in mixed company right, right. and what it's okay to talk about and i think this like is an indication that 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 they they are on some level aware that a lot of this stuff is garbage and not really defensible like that's I, interesting I, I just, you know well here's here's my take on this because what what um and i'll just tell you by, by 
one of my least favorite neologisms is misinformation. Like uh -huh. to me, it's uh -huh. it's it's a made up word that means a certain political group doesn't want you to hear something. That's uh -huh. that's all that's all I hear, right? Because uh -huh. we already had a really good word for lie, which was lie, <laughs> right? And yeah. a, perfect, a perfectly good word for something that was untrue for a long time. And what I find, <laughs> and I, I, refer, I actually, in, my, in some of my writings, I refer to the weasel word misinformation because mm -hmm. it means someone who is doesn't want to call me a liar because they know I'm telling them the truth, but they can get away from calling me a liar and being proven uh -huh. wrong by saying it's misinformation. And the reason I say that is, and I also, I, I, I I understand the point. There's always been propaganda. There have always been people selling their point of view, right? And to me, it's funny because you bring up like, when did this start? To me, if I had to pick the date of misinformation, it was telling people that FDR saved us from the Great Depression when in fact he prolonged it and increased it with all the crap he did, right? So, mm. and that this is where I come down to, I used to have fun because it was, I'm a nerd. But when they'd have the the fact checking, whether it was the Democrats fact checking Trump or Republicans fact checking Hillary, mm -hmm. what you when you look through all the lists of things, if there were a hundred things they were fact checking, two of them turned out to be actual objective plain facts. Everything mm -hmm. else was an interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. So a fact is um, the British assault on Gallipoli was a disaster. Right. Right. During that period of time, the British Empire and the British press were busy telling everyone how gung ho great our assault on the Turkish Empire was going and yay, we're winning. And ironically mm -hmm. enough, no matter what became of Fox News, don't care. Mm -hmm. But the origin of Fox was Rupert Murdoch's father, who was the first journalist to tell the truth. To tell mm -hmm. the truth that it was going disastrously. The mm -hmm. the Turks were mowing down our boys who were trying to climb an indefensible cliff. They were getting killed. And his was the first newspaper out of Australia, of all places, mm -hmm. who was telling the truth to the British Empire. And they, they tried to put him in jail for that. So it's a long, complicated story about lies. What are facts? What's mm -hmm. my power? What do I want? All the way from Constantine deciding to... See, see, see a cross in the clouds and become Christian to win, a, to win a war, right? The pagan emperor saw an image. He thought whether he really saw it or whether he thought this is a great way to kind of infuse some new dynamism in the troops or Alexander the Great demanding everyone shave their beards before going to battle against the Persians, which I think is a terrible mm -hmm. idea. But so <laughs> I, I get, I get, well, my, my biggest concern, and I'll shut up in a second, but but my, my, my overarching point was anytime the government wants to tell me what's true, mm -hmm. every American of any political stripe, that should send up your warning signals like hardcore, mm -hmm. <laughs> hardcore. And when the Department of Homeland Security created a Bureau of Misinformation, I don't care what your political leanings are. That should have been the biggest red flag to everyone that something is wrong here. Am I am mm. I wandering off base from kind of your main point, or is it is it dovetail? No, I think I think you know um, what's disappearing maybe more than anything else for me is is a a consensus about what may or may not be true. Um, you know, a consensus about the limits, let's say, like, you know, if we wanted to sit, like put it in an um, Umberto Echo way, we'd say like the limits of interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. Like this sure. word can mean, you know, X and it can mean, you know, Y, but it can't mean this thing over here, right? So if right. you said this word, you can spin it to a certain degree, like, well, I said freedom and what I, what I mean by freedom is this, but you can't say that, for example, what I mean by freedom is we all live under a dictatorship, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. like this, right. there's like a there's a there's a limit uh, to which you can manipulate meaning, and there's a generally agreed upon idea about the let's say the the range of possible spin, and I and I think that what's maybe gotten out of control is like there is this sort of idea that now it's sort of like anyone can just say anything. And 
first of all, no one has the time to counter all of the dumb arguments in the world. Oh, right? You just ignore them. The marketplace just... of ideas includes ignoring stupidity. Right, right. So Don't argue just... with it. You give it a platform. Just ignore it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there used to be a point at which um, it seems like you, you really you could rely on your interlocutor to engage you in a conversation that fell within a certain reason, right? Sure. And I and I feel like now that's just kind of gone. Yeah, right. And deliberately so, I would argue. There there are yeah. people who deliberately want that. Um, you know, I was having someone tell me the other day that that the idea of proof in mathematics was inherently colonialist and racist. I was like, what? What are you talking about? Math, math is math. Two plus two is four. There's not a lot of cultural discussion around that. Hmm. Yeah, I I mean, there, there's, uh, again, it's sort of the, the range of reason, right? Like there's, and, and I hear this about arguments against science kind of all the time. You know, like the idea that, um, you know, well, but there are no facts in science. There's only theories. Like, no, no, like yeah. theories... And that's, a mis and that's a crucial misunderstanding about how people have been taught about the scientific method, right? Right, exactly. It's yeah. like, you know, like it's, it's, but then you, you, when you try to sort of engage in that conversation, okay, let's talk about like what a theory is in a scientific sense versus what your theory is about what happened, in, you know, on September 11th, right? Like right. there's a difference between like the theory of like gravity Yes, right? yes. <laughs> and the theory that George Bush and the CIA rigged the towers, right? Two very right. different theories. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Right. But there's a little bit of confusion about what the words mean. But I feel like you can't, you know, at this point, um, it's just the, the range has widened to like such a degree that you can't even start. And, and, and what's really depressing about that is I do think that part of respect for people is engaging them. Mm -hmm. uh, in an honest way, um, trying to, I, I, I do think that is, you know, and, and, and this is kind of what happens, let's say in, in families a lot, at some point you stop discussing things with people, right? Yes. And, um, <laughs> and you, and you stop discussing things with people because you, uh, my, my theory would be that because on, on some level you stop respecting them. Um, you stop respecting their opinions to the degree that you won't engage with them anymore because you're, you know, you believe that they're just so far out of whack that there's no way you'll be able to write them. And there's no, there's nothing to be gained by continuing the argument. So, yeah. so I have, I sort of have a theory that especially in person to person, you know, and, and reasonable close relationships, um, arguing with someone is a respectful thing. It, sure. it means we still believe that there is uh, something there, a relationship that that is worth preserving, opinions that could be shifted, um, someone to engage with who is thinking with some amount of reason, et cetera. Um, when you stop arguing, right? <laughs> that's that's I think when when you really feel like the the system has fallen apart. and and so you know, I think that there's a there's a an argument for want of a better word, to be made, that uh, robust disagreement is fundamentally what makes democracy great. And that um, the, one of the most important things that we can do uh, as people who value democracy is to try to continue to remain within that, that constraint of how things can be interpreted so that we can continue to have conversations about how we want to improve the country and you know our our state of being. Um, I, I get really frustrated, for example, with um, the kinds of rhetoric like say, calling someone a communist or a socialist who you know believes in trade unions, right? Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> like right. like a, a, a trade union is a trade union in the United States is not a fundamentally so socialist, nope. you know institution a trade union is there to uh for a bunch of people to protect their own interests sure. in the, in the well, that's fine yep yeah and they, and they have a they have a place um 
and I, I, I just feel like uh, the name calling is the anonymized version of silence in a way, right? Like in, in a family, when you want to get a, get out of argument with someone you don't respect, you don't say anything to them. Right. But online, you just immediately start by insulting their their position behind that mask of anonymity. Sure. You know, I would um, I would also uh, proffer something that as you you know as we were evolved, mm -hmm. we, the animals we are. Right, the amount of there's, there's some number I haven't looked at in a while. There's like some number of like real close interpersonal relationships any one person can manage, right? And 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 yeah. after that, it just becomes a synonymous group. And so, for right. shorthand sake, you were you you adhere yourself to a tribe that yeah. in larger conglomerations has to protect you, right? Um, right. But the the flip side to that, like it's a good example you gave calling someone a communist, right? I was against my better judgment, got dragged into something I, on LinkedIn mm -hmm. or notes, whatever it was. Uh -huh. And I made some comment about it. I left New York City, the city of my birth, when my 12% you know, of people bothered to vote and they elected a communist. And mm -hmm. someone wrote to me, like, you don't know what, I said, first off, I studied Marx and read all of his works for two years with real communists at the University of Chicago and Bill de Blasio, honeymooned in Cuba and supported the Sandinistas. I am not throwing a label at someone, the man is an avowed communist, right? <laughs> Whether yeah. he actually acts on that or not is kind of irrelevant, but the flip side to blanketly calling someone a name you don't have data for is when you do accurately label someone whose characteristics fit the definition, right. the, the equivalent on the other side is to say, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, maybe I know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> now, right. you know, so it's, it's, but that is all part of that anonymous space where being unaccountable to people in a real way, people just let their id flow out of the keyboard, yeah. often without data and often without accountability. And um, I hopefully humans are starting to evolve how to deal with it, right? Like we all heard the TV was going to turn us into gibbering idiots because no one would read anymore and no one would go outside getting exercise and video games are going to make us mass murdering lunatics, right? So there's always right. hysteria around the technology, but right. I have this enduring faith that, that humans adapt. Yeah, and I think, and I, I recently wrote a few things about this too. Man. I do think that in in all of this, some things get lost, like the the fact that the internet is also of extraordinary value. Crazy. Um, well. I mean, I I remember just doing research. My degree was in modern literature. One of my big research papers as a as a senior was on Wilfred Owen, World War One British poet, right? Uh, Anthem for Doomed Youth. So I had this theory that that Wilfred Owen was heavily influenced for some reason by this obscure uh, Victorian poet uh, that had was of a, a, a generation uh, before him called uh, Swinburne. And Swinburne was a poet that's like largely forgotten. He's kind of collected in anthologies, maybe yep. one or two of his poems. But but Swinburne is not really thought of very much. Well, I had found out that you know Wilfred Owen went to Oxford at the time when Swinburne kind of passed through there. Um, and may have met him, but I also had done some textual analysis of his of his poems, and I had found these lines that I, about wounds in World War One that I think that I thought were adapted from Swinburne's very sadomasochistic late Victorian poems. Right. Um, and uh, and at that time, Oxford was digitizing its collections, including all the manuscripts of Wilfred Owen and all of the papers that were you know associated with him. And I was able to look at that stuff. Now, no undergraduate in the world, you know, outside of Oxford would have been able to, to just look at those things. Right. And I was sud suddenly all of this was available to me. And what did I find? But this letter back to his his parents home after he was killed on the Somme Canal about a week before the armistice, listing his the possessions on his person, one of which was a collection of Swinburne's poetry. That's awesome. I mean, <laughs> that's the, the 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 value of the internet is like I actually was able to have this extraordinary academic moment of triumph. Like 
Like, yes, he was reading Swinburne while he was writing these poems you thought were influenced by Swinburne. That I wouldn't have been able to have without the internet. And I use it every day for research yep. and, you know, to get to find academic articles, to find books, to, to I mean, to do so many valuable things. And I think we, we don't talk about that anymore, about just a wonder, what a wonderful resource. It, you know, oh, it's it phenomenal. Be. I look phenomenal. at my kids who are studying in high school now into college and I'm old enough that when I was at the University of Chicago and I lived in the dorms and it was January and it was freezing cold outside and I was writing a paper, I was just going to do without the reference because I had to walk five blocks to the library right. at 10 o'clock right. at night in a right. blizzard. And right. you know what? My academic career can suffer a little. I'm going to make do with what I've got. And you're right, right. but now it's just at your fingertips. You've got the right. resources of the World Library is right there. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I took a class in, in research 1990 would have been probably six uh, in junior college before I, I went to UC Santa Cruz. And there isn't a single thing that I learned in that class that's any that's relevant any longer to doing research. Right. Exactly. I, mean, I learned some great things about about, you know, other like ways to use a library, but like none of those databases exist anymore. None of that is Catalogs, a way to all nothing all gone. And it's and, and it, instead it's been replaced by by in many ways a much more efficient way of, of finding information as long as you know how to use it and yep. what its capabilities and what its pitfalls are which is maybe you know where the focus needs to be when you talk about the human race sort of evolving let's say to to you know uh, adapt to these new conditions one of the things we probably need to be doing is to be better educating people about how to conduct fact fact-based research Yes. on the internet right and just like how to figure out where the article comes from what the sources are how do you you know just doing things like simple rather high speed maneuvers that you would do um like triangulation right yeah like just trying to figure out okay so bbc says this about this thing who else is interested in this event that's happened in the world i want to try to find two other viewpoints on, on the BBC before I get a sense that I might start to know what happened, right? right? Maybe. So I'm gonna look at, you know, maybe, right? right? Um, but it's like just just putting people putting the idea in people's heads that it needs to be at least three sources, right? And it needs three sources that are- And that Wikipedia are is not one of them. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> just getting that level of education would I think be really helpful for people, but we don't, we don't really have that. Um, and then, you know, there's another simple thing and I, we're sort of running up on time, but like the, the, maybe the thing to end on is what is I think it would be extremely valuable to us as a society to rid social media of the algorithm. Um, yep. That's well, a simple solution. That's part of what I meant by people are, are learning how to use it and ignore it. Yeah. When I found out that I, I was on Twitter for a while and when I, I bought, naive me, if I choose to follow you, I expect to see that when you write something, I'm going to see it. No, no, no. Someone's decided what I should see. I, that's when I left. I'm like, I don't, I don't need yeah. this nonsense. Yeah. I've decided I want to hear what Ray has to say. You're going right. to decide for me that what Ray has to say is not very valuable, so I'm not going to get to see it. No, thank you. Bye, bye. It's so, it's it's as if Alexander Graham Bell was like, I understand that you want to call your mom, but actually, we're going to be plugging you into this guy in yeah. Ohio. Really, and he's fascinating. You're gonna like what he has to say. He right, may not have right. the recipe you're looking for, or know when your your grandmother's funeral is, but he's a good guy. Right. <laughs> yeah. <That's good. laughs> well, Ray, I know I know you've got to run. I appreciate you taking the time. Would you know, love to continue the conversation? Uh, aside from exhortation to read read your works, any last words for the Messy Times listenership? No, just thank you, Christopher. It's, uh, you know, I think more conversations that we have like this, the better uh, it'll be for everybody. Amen. And to my long-term listeners, I close with, as I usually do, please turn off the mainstream media who are lying to you and tune into Messy Times. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Learn what Bitcoin is, how it works, and why it matters. Bitcoin 101, your ultimate guide to the fundamentals of blockchain.